Another member of our board who is a recent graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary is our speaker this morning. Uh, he's the owner and media director of the Urology Institute and uh, Continent Center. Uh, Dr. Frank Glover holds a BS in biochemistry from the University of Georgia, two doctorates from John Hopkins in medicine and public health, uh, two master's degree from Dallas Seminary. He commuted to do an MABS and he commuted to do a THM. And he's currently working on his doctorate here at DTS. He's also a board certified by the American Board of Urology as well as the Board of Infectious Control, Infection Control. Dr. Glover is involved with ministry around the world, participating in medical missions through Africa, uh, founding SHIELD in Africa, an organization that helps strengthen their healthcare system. In addition, he ministers closer to home. He leads a weekly home Bible study and discipleship training for local pastors and ministers. He sits on our board of incorporate members at Dallas Seminary, and uh, we're grateful to have him. He also testified before Congress on the Ebola virus that uh, plagued Liberia uh, a few years ago. So uh, he's uh, credentialed, he's in high demand, that he would take time to be a part of our team means a whole lot. And he's married to Marsha. Marsha, where are you seated? Right here. Uh, thank you. Would you stand as he comes so that they can see you, and would you welcome him and her? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bailey, for that warm welcome. It's indeed an honor and privilege to have a chance to address you to my colleagues on the board. It's really an honor and a privilege to serve with you, giants in your field, yet all united in a love for the Lord and for the seminary. And to our distinguished faculty, whom I've had the pleasure of taking courses from over the last 15 years. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking forward to the one in Brazil, though, next in January. And uh, to Pastor Joe, uh, who has become a good friend, uh, thank you for putting my name up. And I'd also like to recognize my wife of 30 years. We met at Johns Hopkins, she's a pediatrician. And I have two of our three children here, Danielle, who just finished law school and is waiting to check her, her, her bar her bar results, and uh, she can't get through on the internet yet, so uh, we'll, we'll have a celebration later. And, and Frank III, who is at Emory in the MD-PhD program, uh, who will come into being a urologist in the future. Uh, let's go to Lord in prayer. Uh, gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the many riches that you give us in Christ Jesus. I ask that you would open hearts and minds to hear what you would have, and that the Spirit would do what it does in enlightening and encouraging and strengthening us for service to our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I've chosen for my passage today, uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter five. Uh, 1 Peter chapter five, uh, looking at a few verses, verses five to 11, uh, this book was written, of course, by the Apostle Peter to those Christians who were really suffering in Asia Minor under a great persecution as an encouragement to them to remain faithful until that day. So if you're able, uh, I'd like us to stand and, and read uh, these few verses. In the same way, you who are younger Submit yourselves to your elders, all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while, 
will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to tell you about a group of people that live in East Africa called the Maasai. And the Maasai are known because they have some fierce warriors. They've never been conquered because of the resiliency of their spirit. They get this way because their young men, as part of their training, have to face lions. It begins with a mother crying. She's tearful because her son has come to her and put his chair in front of her. And he sits down and as a custom, she begins to shave his head because her son, this boy who she carried in her womb for nine months, whom she raised up around the house, has come to her and said, I want to be a Maasai warrior. She knows that he is about to leave the home, go into the bush, spend years in training with the older warriors, but when he comes back, if he comes back, he'll be a man. And not just any man, he'll be a Maasai warrior. So he goes out to learn how is it that you, a mere man, can stand and face a 500 pound beast intent on killing you, armed with only courage and a spear. So the boys go out and they're being led and they learn how to deal with adversity. How do you deal with hunger? What do you do with thirst? How do you live amongst the wild animals? And when you come across the lion, what do you do? How do you stand? How do you execute? So the boys are out learning this, and then one day, it's time. And they get the boys together, and they begin to paint their faces with white and blue and orange paint made from the residue of lions that were previously killed. And so the elder warriors are in the back and the young boys are in the front. They're the ones that's tracking the lion. They're looking at footprints. They're looking at droppings. They're smelling the air. And then they see the lion. Now when they see the lion, one boy, the most courageous of the group, is the one that will face the lion first. And everybody knows who he is. So he steps out of the line and he takes off of his neck the beads and he walks to the back of the line and he places these beads on his father's neck. Now his father is trembling inside. He's proud that his son is the most brave of the warriors, but he has some discontent because he knows his son, his son is gonna be in potential peril. And so the boy walks out in front and he locks eyes with the lion. And the lion locks eyes on him. And then the lion lets out a roar. When the lion roars, you can hear it for miles. The lion roars to intimidate its prey. And when the prey is intimidated and tries to run, the lion pursues. A lion can run 100 meters in six seconds. The world's fastest human can't do it in less than nine. So no one can outrun the lion. And so the boy has no option but to stand. And when the lion opens his mouth, teeth bellowing, talons like razors, and lunges at him, he takes his spear, six foot long spear, and he plunges it 
into the heart of the lion. And the lion collapses. And when he collapses, they cut off the mane and they put it on the boy as a headdress. And they cut off the tail and they put it on a spear. And they march triumphantly back into the village where everyone is celebrating the new crop of young warriors. I tell you this story because Satan, the devil, is described in 1 Peter 5, 8 as a roaring lion who is prowling about. So I think we may be able to learn some things from these Maasai warriors about dealing with the devil. We're all here at Dallas Theological Seminary, and we're all training for a life of service and ministry. But we've got to be aware that there is an adversary, the devil, and some of us may be casualties. How can you ensure that when you're attacked, that your faith will not fail, that you'll continue on and serve the Lord to the end. To do that, you must act. A-C-T. You must have an attitude of humility, courage to trust the Lord, and the proper training in the context of other believers. I've come to tell you that you must humbly trust the almighty God of grace to mature you through your sufferings, then you can withstand the devil and remain steadfast in your faith. You must humbly trust the almighty God of grace to mature you through your sufferings, then you can withstand the devil and remain steadfast in your faith. I've entitled this message, The Big-Headed Man Cannot Stand. <laughs> the Big-Headed Man yes, sir. Cannot Stand. Now, some of you are probably wondering, what does he mean by big-headed? Okay, I'm going to give you the Bible's definition of what we call the big-headed man. It can be found in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 1, beginning at verse 24. But since you refuse to listen when I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. It says, likewise, you younger, submit, hupertasso, come under the authority of those that are your elders. Yes, all of you be clothed one to another with humility because God resisteth the proud. God opposes the, the proud. Antitasso, that's a military term. If you want God to fight against you, if you want all the things you're working for to come to naught, just be proud. This is what Peter is saying. And the half-brother of Jesus is saying the same thing. James chapter 4, verse 6. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he will lift you up in due time. So Peter said it. James said it. But Solomon said it a thousand years earlier. Proverbs 3, 34. He mocks the proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. So humility is very important. 
There's a report of a man in Southern Africa that wanted to see the lions. And so he went to the game reserve where they had the lions on display and he went up to the keeper and said, sir, I would like to see the lions. He said, well, that's good. We've got a van there and yeah, in about 12 minutes, they'll be pulling off. You can get on the van and then we go, no, no, no. I am the son of a king, and I will walk among the lions. The guy said, I don't know who you're the son of, <laughs> but those are man killers in there. You can't go in there. Not to be deterred, he waited until the man went off shift, came back that evening with some wire cutters, and he cut his way into the fence, and he stepped on in, and he began to walk among the lions until one of them roared, and he panicked, and he ran as fast as he could to get out, but to no avail. The lion bit him on the head, crushed his skull, and the other lions jumped on him and riddled his body with bite marks. The next day, they had to drag his lifeless body from the enclosure. You say, well, that's really stupid. Who, who would do something like that? But we have to be careful that we're not guilty of the same thing. I'm a graduate of the Dallas Theological Seminary. <laughs> I'll have you know I've got five semesters of Greek and four semesters of Hebrew, I know what I'm talking about. And then when you go into ministry as a young person, you're sitting in that ministry meeting and the devil comes. Psst. Hey, look here. You're surrounded by some ignorant folk, uneducated, you know. You are obviously the smartest person in this room. Boom. And as a matter of fact, you still got those notes from class. Woo -woo. <laughs> you know, you might as well just take over this thing. You've been here three months already. <laughs> you must have an attitude of humility. And you must have courage. What is courage? Some people say courage means I'm not afraid of anything. I laugh at danger. No, that's not courage, that's foolishness. <laughs> Every one of us has fear. Fear is the body's natural response to danger. The question is, what do you do with your fear? It tells us in the seventh verse, casting all your care upon him, because he cares for you. Casting, epirepto, in the participle, mean it's linked to the previous clause. It takes humility to take your troubles and your worries and your financial considerations and your marital stresses. It takes courage to humbly submit you can't handle it. You've got to take it and cast it onto the Lord. Amen. And you're going to cast it onto the Lord because he cares for you. Now notice, when you're casting something, you've got to let it go. You can't cast something and hold on to it at the same time. So when you cast it, notice where you're casting it. You're not casting it onto your spouse. You're not casting it onto an institution. You're casting it on to the Lord because he cares for you. You see, courage is understanding the presence of the Lord. Isaiah 41.10, fear thou not, for I am with thee. 
Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. When David talks about walking through the valley of the shadow of death, it's not because David is such a bad boy. He says, because thou art with me. Courage means you're depending on the Lord. Because when you depend on the Lord, you're humbly submitting that only he can do it. So we have to have an attitude of humility. We have to have a healthy dose of courage based on trust in the Lord. And finally, we have to have the proper training. Now, the training, it, it tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says that we are to resist the devil. Antistate. Resist the devil in the faith. But how do you resist the devil in the faith? Well, the next clause tells us, it says that we have to know something. To remain steadfast in the faith, there's something you've got to know. And you don't know it intellectually, because the word here is oida. That's to know someone, to know something about someone. And it says you have to know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are suffering the same way. We are in an institution where dozens of countries are represented. You can't walk through this campus and not see someone different from you, from a different cultural, ethnic, racial, socioeconomic, gender. We're here. That's the reason we have our spiritual formation. I would encourage you to take the spiritual formation seriously. I know they put you in a group with a bunch of folks you don't like. <laughs> but this is the process whereby you learn to understand who that person is, what their challenges are, and you begin to see that person the way God sees the person. You begin to see the image of God in someone with an accent or someone from another part of the world. But this is the means by which we're going to resist the devil and remain steadfast in our faith. You have a wonderful opportunity here. When you leave here, if you miss this, you're at risk. You see, when the lion attacks its prey, it looks for the one that's out from the pack. All the animals are running, but they lock in on that old one or that young one or that sick one or the one that's just not paying attention. We had a chance to take, I took my kids when they were teenagers to the Masamara. We went to the Serengeti and we saw all the animals. And we were riding in the truck. And all of a sudden, the guide said, okay, we're going to get out now. <laughs> now, I thought my wife was going to faint. <laughs> but I had on some snake-proof boots up to my knees. And all my kids were right behind me. And everywhere I stepped, they were stepping, and I immediately noticed one thing. The grass was the exact same color as the lion's mane. And so as we were walking, even though we had a warden in front of us with a high-powered rifle, I was looking this way and this way. That's what it means to be sober, vigilant, to be in a constant state of readiness, knowing the devil is out there. He's out there. And if we don't stick together, you're going to be prey. 
devoured. Okay, that's katapino, to swallow up. When the lion gets done with its prey, there's nothing there but bones that the buzzards are picking off of. That's what Satan wants to do to you. That's what Satan wants to do to me. But we are to resist him in the faith, knowing we need each other. Because when you're dealing with the devil, you're going to get hurt. People are going to lie on you. They're going to undermine you. They're going to use you. They're going to trick you, betray you. And this pain, God knows. Because it goes on to say, after you've suffered for a while, he's going to restore you. Okay? Katatizo. That's the same word when the sons of Zebedee were mending their nets. God is going to put you back together again after you've suffered for a while. The first Messiah warrior to get a master's from Clemson University was a guy named James. And James tells the story of the day he met the lion. He said, on that day I was brave. But the lion was brave too. <laughs> and I had my comrades with me, and as we were going to approach the lion, I had one here on the left, one on the right, we formed a triangle, so that if I got into trouble, they could stab the lion without us stabbing each other. And so James saw the lion, and he locked eyes with the lion, and the lion locked eyes with him. And then the lion lunged, and James took that spear, intent on plunging it into his heart, but as he was plunging, the lion dodged, and he missed the heart. He put four feet of the spear into the lion's chest. The lion was wounded, but not mortally, and the lion was enraged, and the lion bit him on his shoulder. He said he felt pain go throughout his whole body, and he reached for his knife, and the lion took his paw and kicked his elbow, and the knife flew out, and then he gashed James in the abdomen, and, and he didn't know at the time, but his bowels had fallen out, and his friends couldn't get a shot because he had James in his mouth. He was turned this way, and he turned that way, until finally he bit James on the leg, he began to bleed, and he dropped him. And his comrades pounced on the lion. They killed the lion. Well, James wasn't dead, but he was really hurt. And they picked James up, and they took him to a cave. And the things they'd been learning over the years, the medicinal properties of the various plants, they nursed James back to health until he was strong enough to walk 20 miles back to the village where everybody was surrounded, celebrating how James had faced the lion and came out. If you're going to face the devil, you have to have an attitude of humility, a healthy dose of courage, and a proper training in the context of other believers. You must humbly trust the almighty God of grace to mature you through your sufferings. Then you can withstand the devil and remain steadfast in your faith. Thank you.